Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, December 8th, 2011. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. But this week, Andy Sparks gives us an audio tour of his home brewery in progress. I've been after Andy for a while to do a special video tour of his brewing setup. He says it's not ready to look at yet, but he did spend some time talking us through his gear. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And our new 2012 Brewer's Logbooks are in the house. Get yours. Uh, Order yours now so that you can either give it to your favorite brewer for Christmas or give it to yourself for Christmas and be ready to hit the ground running uh, as 2012 uh, dawns. And you can do your first, you can log your first of 50 batches of beer uh, in the book. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. Also, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. We also have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook, facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us first and click on our associate link. It won't cost you any extra And you'll be helping us to bring you the show. And we greatly appreciate your support, especially during this holiday season. And there is now an Amazon.co.uk link on our site as well. So you can click across the waters there. Uh, We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site, too. You can find our basic brewing iPhone and Android apps on their respective stores. And we're on the BlackBerry podcast directory now, too. Uh, Let's take a quick look into the mailbag before we head over to Andy's house. John from Antioch, California writes, I enjoy listening to the collaborative experiments and always learn something new. Thanks, John. I I learned something new, too. Uh, However, I have noticed that you and the collaborators use different recipes and styles for these experiments. So I was wondering if some of the variables would be eliminated by brewing with a base recipe of barley, hops, water, steeping and boil time and temperature, uh, type of yeast, and fermentation time and temp, all the same. Uh, I just heard you read from the mailbag, uh, Will of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he mentioned that one experiment doesn't prove enough and more experiments would be needed. So maybe a recipe with constant ingredients may offer a good proving ground. That's an interesting idea, John. It certainly uh, wouldn't eliminate all the variables completely because, of course, Everybody has his or her own uh, brewing style and equipment uh, and, uh, you know, locations. I mean, it depends on where you are in relation to sea level, uh, you know, uh, the temperature of your, of your boil and such as that. However, uh, getting everybody to brew the same recipe would probably be useful in certain experiments. So uh, I'll talk to Chris about that and uh, put that idea in the hat. You know, to be honest, part of the fun for me is uh, seeing what everybody chooses to brew for the experiments. Uh, I love seeing the diverse uh, tastes that homebrewers across the the country and around the world have. But, uh, you know, it's it's worth a a thought at least. I appreciate it. Uh, Peter in New Hampshire asks, uh, can you go over the costs of the ingredients in a five-gallon batch? Yeast, hops, grain, etc. The price per bottle would be very interesting to viewers who do not now brew at home. That's another interesting idea. It's uh, it's a bit tricky uh, because the cost of the ingredients vary, you know, depending on where and when you buy them. Uh, take hops, for example. You know, you can buy them on in bulk online pretty cheaply, uh, at least for now. And if they're divided up, say, for per ounce or per two ounces or whatever, uh, at local homebrew shops, it may be more expensive, um, you know, but, and, and over the, the, uh, the course of the life of this podcast, of course, we've, we've seen uh, hop prices on kind of a roller coaster uh, ride as, as shortages and surpluses come and go over time. So, however, it may be fun to do some sort of a show i uh, sort of putting a benchmark in the in the sand, so to speak, and and just saying here at this at this particular time, this is like the average cost of brewing a batch of uh, a five gallon or twenty liter 
uh, batch of beer. Uh, so, that, I mean, that that may be worth uh, doing a show uh, just all in itself and just to kind of look at the price ranges around the country and around the world. Uh, finally, from the mailbag, I have to tease Scott in Las Vegas. Uh, <laughs> he sent a very kind note and uh, demonstrated the dangers of autocorrect on the iPhone. Scott says, I made the zombie Belgian, except I put the D candy sugar at the end of the boil. Mine is extremely lighter. Very interesting. I usually boil my uh, Belgian uh, candy uh, syrups and sugars uh, for half an hour, so maybe that maybe that's the difference. Uh, Scott says, it's still good, but looks a lot different. I will make others. Uh, thanks to you and Steve for the videos. You are a great duo. I really enjoy them. Well, I appreciate that, Scott. Uh, he says, I started listening to the radio podcast as I was running. It makes the moles go by faster. And <laughs> at that point, I actually put the coffee down and uh, had to had to laugh a little bit. Uh, Scott then sent a follow up note clarifying clarifying afterwards that it, that it was the miles that were going by faster, not the moles. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're running slow when you when you see the mole runs, you know, pop up faster than you're going as you're running by. So uh, anyway, thanks for the note, Scott, and I, I hope you don't mind me teasing you just a bit. You should read the emails from uh, from Steve, you know, because he, sometimes he gets in a hurry. He doesn't proofread very well. So it... <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get into our interview. Andy Sparks, as you know, probably is the owner of thehomebrewery.com, which is the shop in Fayetteville, Arkansas that I go to here locally. It's the birthplace of this podcast, by the way. And uh, the first three episodes, you know, as you remember, probably were recorded in the back room of the uh, shop. But anyway, as I said uh, in the beginning of this show, uh, I've been bugging Andy to talk about his home brewery on video. He says it's it's still not ready for the screen or even photos, uh, but he did uh, agree to give us a progress report on audio on where he brews his tasty beers. Well, Andy Sparks, where the heck are we? Well, we're in my garage, or my brewery, as I like to call it. <laughs> there's certainly no cars in here. Yeah, there's a motorcycle over there. <laughs> so there, there, it is a haven for, for at least one wheeled vehicle. Uh, but uh, it, is a, it is taken over by uh, loftier uh, aspirations. There's a, a couple of uh, big refrigerators in here for, for storing beer that's already brewed. Well, that's right. I have uh, one refrigerator in here that's for finished beer, um, and it's uh, got a nickname. It's called Andy's Magic Beer Fridge. It's a three-door refrigerator, um, and it has kegs all along the bottom, and I keep my beer collection up on the top shelves. Um, but I also have another commercial size refrigerator. It's just a two-door, and I use that for fermentation. Which we'll talk about at the at the end of the process. I wanted to take some time. We eventually we plan to eventually do a video uh, podcast episode with showing your brewing setup uh, when it is uh, when it is finished to your satisfaction. Uh, but you know that that the way projects go, that may be a while. <laughs> so I kind of wanted to get a you know kind of a snapshot of, of where you are right now. Uh, which is certainly a lot farther along than, than when you first started, uh, to take kind of an audio look at your system uh, to see uh, where you are right now. And we can talk about where you want to be eventually as well. But let's start at the wall. Uh, when you This is an electric system, and when you first started brewing electrically, uh, you found your setup wanting? Well, you know... When I first kind of started to put the the brewery together, I, I had propane. I used propane for a long time to to brew with, but I knew that I kind of wanted to switch to an electric brewery. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, um, I don't like having to run to the store every time I want to brew and buy another uh, uh, tank of propane. It's nice that I electric brewery. It's it's always here. It's always ready to go. Um, so, and the other thing is cost. It's a little cheaper to do uh, do it with electricity. Um, one of the reasons for that is that when you're heating water with electric with electricity, especially the way I do it with a uh, heating element uh, like a hot water heater element, um, all the energy is being pushed into the water, and none of it is being um, 
wasted as heat that's coming up around the sides of the pot and warming the room that you're in. Um, so I also wanted to be able to brew in the dead of the winter with the door shut, and I didn't really like the idea of you know running a propane burner inside the house or inside the garage. Um, you know, so I th- I've been wanting to go all electric. Um, so when I decided to do that, I started, um, like you said, at the wall. Um, and the truth is I didn't have anywhere near the amount of electricity that I, um, needed to have in the garage. The truth is the electricity for the garage was basically just a, you know, hanging off the gar- the electricity that, uh, goes to my home theater. Um, so you really hate to be, you know, using all that for your, uh, your brewery. Um, <clears throat> so what I did is I, um, I actually pulled two complete services out to the garage, two new 60 amp services. So that brings me a total of 120 total amps out to the garage. Now I won't ever need anywhere near that, but what that does is it gives me several, um, dedicated connections. So dedicated outlets. I have two 220 outlets that are dedicated, and then they, I can draw them down to 30 amps. Um, so that's a lot of juice going to two two things. Uh, um, I never pull that much energy. Um, I use 4,500 watt um, hot water heater elements. I have one in my uh, in my hot uh, liquor tank, um, which is an aluminum pot. Uh, it's a 25 gallon aluminum pot with a hot water heater element. Um, actually bolted into the side of it down near the bottom um, and it has a temperature probe in it um, and those uh, all run back um, to the central control unit that I use to control everything um, for my brew pot though I use just a heat stick I have two different style heat sticks they're both 450 watts um, 220 but one is shaped kind of like an L and one is kind of straight so depending on the style of pot I'm using that day um, I can switch out um, and technically, I could put them both in at the same time and plug them both in to get 9,000 watts um, <laughs> if I really wanted to. I've never really needed that. It's a little overkill. So 9,000 watts? Mm-hmm. 9,000 watts of uh, electricity <laughs> right into my brew pot, yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, have you done any kind of, I mean, it sounds like a lot of juice. It sounds like it would be expensive. But have you done some cost analysis between propane and electricity? Right. Um, so the way electric energy is um, usually um, charged to most uh, people, um, the way it's built out, is that you are charged based on the kilowatt. That's the thousand watts per hour. Um, so let's say my brew pot was on for a whole hour, on steady, full blast for an hour. Um, I have a 4,500 watt uh, element. So that would equal... 4.5 kilowatts um so if your current billing rate is like mine which i think is around 10 cents it might be be conservative let's say 12 or even let's say 15 cents it's still you're you're talking a buck two bucks something like that so maybe uh whereas a you know i probably would burn through a half a tank of propane maybe more especially when you're doing all grain and you're having to heat your 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 uh, hot liquor tank first and then you're going to be boiling two later so uh you use more energy that way um so you know in the, and also like i said before th- all the heat is going into the liquid none of it's just creating heat for the room um so uh you know i think it's probably a better way to go um you know people might be able to argue that but uh i like it <laughs> <laughs> and the the um uh, you know when you're talking about propane uh, i do propane boiling and and uh, mashing and all outside and if it's cold and if it's windy, I'm going to use a lot more propane than if you're here in the in the nice, uh, comfy uh, garage away from the the wind, even when it's chilly outside as it is today. And as you said, if all of that energy is going straight into the the fluid instead of going around the the pot, um, it's it's going to be just by nature more efficient. Yeah, that's the way I see it too. Um, one of the things that I do in here, uh, and one of the things you might want to consider, um, is that when I close off the garage and I get the pot boiling, there is a lot of con- condensation in the garage. So it, it's pretty tough. Um, you know, I guess I could put in some sort of vent um, and, 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 and vent the garage. So I can't completely shut the garage and do, you know, a full boil. 
Um, but one of the things I can do is uh, I can reduce kind of the aggressiveness of the boil. Um, so I control my entire brewery with something called the, a BCS, a brewery control system by embedded control concepts. And uh, they, um, this little device plugs into my network and then from there I can attach to it with my PC across the network and I can control it. I can actually watch, you know, things about it. And what it does, it does a few things. It, it uh, gives me four temperature um, probes so I can monitor four different temperatures. Um, I can also turn on and off uh, eight different things. So um, let's say I want to turn on um, my brew kettle. Uh, I can actually uh, monitor the temperature and turn it on at a certain temperature or turn it off at a certain temperature. I can also um, do things like, um, say, turn the heating element on for 50% um, of, of the time. So, you know, over every five seconds or so, it would be on for um, half the time and off for half the time, which in effect reduces its power by half. So in, uh, what I can do is I can... I can keep dialing down, I can throttle down the, that, that heating element um, so that it's only on 40% of the time or 30% of the time. And I can set that span from, you know, 4 or 5 seconds to 10 seconds, depending on how fast I want that to pulse. Um, and what I can do is I can bring it right down to just a simmer or bring it up to a nice little even boil. Um, so you don't have to, you know, run it at full throttle the entire time. So. And there's a, since it's on the network there's an added advantage in that uh, that you can start the brew day in bed essentially yeah that's true um it's pretty cool this the the somebody came up with a uh, a little uh, iphone app um that you can use you can also just go to you know a web browser any web browser and control the device um and yeah what i can do is and what i normally do to for my brew days is i I stage my water into my hot liquor tank um, and then get everything set up and ready to go and then set my alarm and in the morning uh, when I wake up I just roll over and tell it to start the hot liquor tank and go to 180 degrees and wait for me to get my cup of coffee and come out. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's worth the price of admission right there in my opinion. <laughs> So that so you can uh, you can it's literally on your phone if it's on the if you're on the network anywhere you can you can take a look at what your your temperature probes are doing on this BCS system. Right. Yeah. So um, during the brew day, uh, you know you can and I do I turn everything on and off with my iPhone or at the at the PC by clicking. You know, so I hook my pump to it and I turn the pump on and off by clicking on the on the button for the pump. Um, I have a heat stick that I use. I can use in my mash tun to kind of warm the mash tun up, and I can, I can put that in there. Um, and then when I'm all done, I uh, in I have the uh, one of the two refrigerators also controlled by the BCS. So this uh, two door um, commercial refrigerator is being controlled by the the BCS. And there's two temperature probes usually in there at all times. One inside some liquid, and one inside some, in just hanging in the air. And that way I can usually get kind of the, the liquid and air temperature in there. And that's nice because I can see it on, it has a little graph. And I can, so I can see the air temperature fluctuates up and down as the unit kicks on and off. So I can watch it cycle. I can also see the liquid temperature is, is a very good approximation of what the, the beer will be once it stabilizes inside the cooler. So um, I use those two and then I can, you know, set the fermenter to whatever I want it to be. And I guess while it's uh, actively fermenting, uh, you could... Could you see a, a? Could you see the inside of the fermenter being warmer than the outside of the the fermenter because of the active fermentation and the heat that the fermentation gives off? I mean, do you see that? Um, you could probably. Um, if I want to actually put a temperature probe and actually monitor the internal temperature of the fermenting beer, um, I actually have some things so I can do that. Um, I do. I ferment in. Um, in commercial Sankey kegs a lot, um, the 15-gallon style. And I have a special device that clamps onto the top and allows me to, it has a thermal well in it. And I can actually drop the the probe for the BCS right to the core of that and actually monitor its core temperature, the internal temperature of the refrigerator, and, you know, the constant liquid temperature that's, you know, just monitoring the temperature of the thing. So, and you can, and it graphs all those things, so you can watch all those things change. Ah, so you can have a visual record over time of, how all your gear is 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 doing make sure everything's 
on the up and up. Right. As a matter of fact, one of the things I like to do is get the graph set up when I'm getting ready to start the mash. And that way I can actually, when I'm done with my, uh, you know, uh, with the mash uh, and everything's converted, I actually have kind of a graph of the temperature steps and as uh, the whole way through. So um, I typically just do single infusion. Uh, so I don't see a lot of stuff, but you do get to see that it rose to here, stabilized. You saw it, you can see that it, does it dip? How many times did it dip? You know, um, you know, it's pretty interesting. And and for the uh, back to the the fermenters, you, you if you've got a you've got a separate system set up so you can actually watch your beer ferment uh, from wherever you are too, <laughs> which which I've seen other people do as well. Uh, you know, putting their uh, uh, you don't have it publicly available, but uh, you know you're able to see actually watch your beer ferment. And I imagine uh, you know you. you it, with my luck, I would set this up and I would be, you know, a thousand miles away and watching a, an explosive blow off or something <laughs> going on, and there would be nothing I could do about it. <laughs> well, the blow off would be trapped inside the refrigerator. It'd probably be okay, you know. Uh, <laughs> it, it's it is pretty nice. I have a security camera system that I have set up. Mainly, it's not really so much for security, so much as that I can watch my dogs and watch my beer ferment and. Uh, <laughs> So, and yeah, I do. I have uh, at least one camera in the fermentation locker usually, and sometimes two, uh, and then one in the garage kind of monitoring the brewery, and then some around the house so that I can see the dogs playing on the back deck and stuff like that. But it is pretty nice. Um, whenever I do get a beer started, and Sunday is almost always when I brew, uh, Monday morning I go to work, and that's about when the beer starts to get really fun and start to take off. And, and it's it's nice. I can actually put it... Uh, pull the laptop up at my desk um, and put on the fermenter and fermenter cam and actually my friends come by and, and watch the, the beer <laughs> ferment at my desk. <laughs> now, is there anything else we need to cover on the brains of the operation? Mm. Uh, there, you've got a diff- there are a couple of different controllers that they sell and you've... Right. Um, I got the original one. Um, it's the smaller of the two. They, they now make one with additional um, temperature probes. The new one has eight temperature probes where mine only has four um i certainly would love to have some more temperature probes that's you know since it's the thing they they include the fewest of it's always the thing you wish you had more of um uh you know i i'm seriously tempted to get another get the 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 new bcs which is uh i say eight temperature probes and like i think eight 18 new outputs so that's a bunch and you can get additional controller cards and control dozens more output so i could with some and it does allow you to do some programming so i could in essence really write some sophisticated programs to you know monitor temperatures turn things on and off you know uh i don't do that so much i just really just turn it on and off as i go and uh, um but like i was saying i'm i am tempted to get the newer unit use that for the brewery side and then use my smaller unit for the fermentation side um, that way, I could have a dedicated four temperature probes into the in the in the fermentation locker, maybe monitoring two beers, and then the temperatures. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I'd like to I'd I'd like to get the the new one, but uh, you know, uh, there, there's always more toys. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> I do. Yeah, we haven't covered a lot of the little the a lot of the bling, a lot of the little uh, the, the the stainless gadgets and stuff. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that I'd like to get uh, down the road. I don't know whether I will or not. You know, it's one of those things. You, 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 every time you brew, it seems like I, I, I think of something else I, that would make my life a little easier or make the <laughs> process go a little smoother. And uh, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Now you also use the the uh, uh, BCS for cooking as well. That's right. Um, since after I kind of got the the brewery hooked up and I've been using it for a while. I realized that, uh, well, I had a smoker that uh, was a gas-powered smoker, but it had kind of stopped working. <clears throat> the The gas part had gotten, you know, gotten messed up, and so I was either going to have to replace the gas components in it and, and, you know, repair it, and then I got to thinking, well, I can turn on and off, you know, 220 volts. I can monitor temperatures, smoker, you know, about the same as my brewery. You shouldn't get up above about 210, 212 so I uh, took my smoker and, uh, you know, kind of cannibalized it and uh, ran electric power to it. I got a stovetop uh, burner and uh, wired that up 
to the 220. And now uh, when I want to smoke, I just roll that out to the driveway. And uh, it has a little smoke generator. It's called a Bradley smoke generator that uses these pucks um, that kind of just continuously feeds these pucks in to generate the smoke. And then the heating element just keeps the box warm so that I can uh, keep the, the smoker at, you know, 180, 190 degrees for 12 hours, whatever. Or I can turn the heater, heating element on, um, and when it gets cold out like it is today, I could run the smoker and put cheese in it and do kind of cold smoking and do, uh, you know, smoked cheese or maybe some smoked salmon or something like that that you want to do more like a curing or drying or smoked barley, if you wanted to. Oh, you could certainly do that. <laughs> now, back to brewing. Take us through, because I want to talk about your, your brew stand as well. Okay. So, to kind of take us through, you know, linearly a, a brew day and, and kind of describe your equipment as we as we go along. Okay. So, um, when I get started for a brew day, the first thing I'll do is um, I'll bring all the ingredients home from the shop. Um, Which is handy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have a stainless steel stand that um, was originally made, I had made for a different purpose. Uh, I was going to use it to to package malt and other things with at my store. Um, and it's, it consists of a giant stainless steel funnel um, on a stainless steel stand. And uh, I decided later that it would make a better... Uh, brewery so what I do is the funnel is is way way up at the very top of the stand and it's a big funnel it's probably two feet across at the top at least um, and it's probably two feet deep um, almost maybe three feet deep and uh, it'll hold quite a bit um, and what I do is I dump all my grain into that funnel and I'm, that allows me to meter the grain um, slowly into the the mash tun that rests below it um, at the very bottom of the stand is the hot liquor tank. Um, so it's kind of a vertical stand with the grain silo at the top, mashed on in the middle, and the hot liquor tank underneath it. Um, I heat the water. As I said before, I can just turn that on um, in, from inside and wait for it to get to 180, and it'll hold it at a constant 180 until I'm, I'm ready for it. Um, and then I, what I do is I pump that up into the, the mash tun, uh, filling it to the level that I want for the beer I'm making. Um, and, you know, the amount of strike water that I'm going to need. Uh, and I, I, I let it rest for a little while. Um, and kind of that, that helps stabilize the temperature of the mash tun. It's a stainless steel keg. Um, and so, and if the mash tun uh, stabilizes too low, I can always drain the water back into the, the, the vessel below it, warm it some more, and bring it back up. Um, so it's pretty easy to get the mash tun, you know, dialed in to the perfect temperature. And then once uh, I get the right amount of strike water in there, I have a, a cordless drill with a like a kind of a paint stirrer thing at the bottom of it. And uh, what I do is I stand up there and I meter the grain in with one hand with, you know, just kind of letting it flow through out of the bottom of this big stainless funnel. And then I stir it with the, the cordless drill and get a nice consistent uh, mix of my mash, get rid of any dough balls. Uh, then once it's, you know, completely, uh, all the grain is dumped out of the silo, um, or the funnel above, uh, I give it a good stir, get it all stabilized, um, put the, 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 uh, lid on, and then I start monitoring the, uh, the, uh, the temperature on the BCS. Um, you wait, uh, you know, your hour, hour and a half, depends on what your recipe calls for. Um, if it seems to drop, and I can watch the, uh, the, uh, temperature on the BC, uh, on the BCS, uh, and the temperature probe I have is is on a long kind of a on kind of a long wand. It's a kind of a single uh, uh, thermal well that I've got. It's about two feet long, and so I can probe all down inside the the mash tun and, and just double check all the temperatures, make sure there's not any cold spots or hot spots. Um, but uh, if it does drop, I can always take the I have a heat stick, and it's just a 110 heat stick. Um, but uh, now, for those who are uninitiated into the, who haven't heard our episodes on on the heat sticks, uh-huh. describe what a heat stick is. Okay, so a heat stick is something that um, you make. Now, I think they they do make a couple of these out there now, but most people, most homebrewers make them, and you make it with a hot water heater element, a couple different pieces of uh, plumbing hardware, um, and some epoxy. And you hook all this stuff up, you, you do what's called potting, which is you mix this epoxy and you, you pour it down inside the, the plumbing parts where you've got your, the wires connected to the, the heating element, and that completely encases the, the, the parts that could 
short out uh, or get in contact with water and it completely encases them in in, in epoxy um, you uh, you know you, you you hook all this together um, and what you end up with is basically a hot water heater element on a stick <laughs> um, uh, and they work really really well um, the the one thing about you know is that most of the time they are simply a heating element with a plug at the other end so they need to be submerged um, before you plug them in and uh, so the in, uh, so they don't sh- the the heating element will, will burn up uh, most of them will if you if they're out out of water they're not meant to be fire dry fired is what it's called um, now there are some heating elements the ones I use for my 220. Um, those are called ultra low watt density heating elements, and those actually can be dry fired. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't recommend it. I wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't. I don't. I don't do it. On, you know, on purpose. But it can withstand dry firing. Um, anyway, you you have these heat sticks. They have. Uh, they get really hot. Um, and uh, what I do is, uh, if if the mash tun starts to cool off, I take the 110 heat stick, submerge it in the mash tun, go plug it in, and then I get up there and stir it and watch the graph. And as the temperature climbs back to where I want it, I get down, unplug it, and pull it out. Um, but uh, you could actually hook it to the BCS so that I, I could watch it and have it shut off when it war- when it gets warm enough, you know. So, but I don't bother with that. I just do it the simple way. And I have to. I have a heat stick, and I love it. And I have to credit uh, Jeff Karpinski who who sent me the heat stick. I didn't have to to go through the. Uh, you know, the, luckily for me, because I would probably electrocute myself if I were to build one myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm not handy that way, but uh, anyway, I, I, mine is great for uh, for bringing, uh, helping the the propane or the or the the stove top, whichever I'm using, come up to to uh, temperature faster. And uh, look in the archives, uh, search for heat stick or electric brewing in the archives, and, and uh, you can get a better idea of how to build one of those things. So you've got your your mashes done, and now what happens? Well, then I uh, I run that off into the brew pot. I have a uh, one of the nice Blackman boiler makers, uh, and it uh, what is a 20, 20 gallon? It's a butte. Uh, got it last year for Christmas, and uh, so that's what I boil in. Boil for whatever you know it calls for. You know, sometimes they call for a little longer. You know, um, so I boil, and when I'm done with that. I pump it over into the conical fermenter, which is located inside the refrigerator. And again, the the boil is done with the heat sticks, right? There's That's no right. element built into the kettle. That's right. Um, I, I could do that. I could punch a hole in the bottom of the, the brew pot and install permanently install um, the heating element right in there. But I kind of like the way this works because I, I have the option of switching between the style of heat stick I want to use uh, and the heat stick just hangs nicely in there, and the heating element basically rests just off the bottom of the pot, which really makes for a you know a good you know it's way down in in the, in in the fluid, so it's you know generating all its heat way down in there. Um, yeah, I really like the way it works with the heat sticks, and I don't and my pot doesn't have a big hole in it, so you know if I did put the heat stick in and you know permanently install it. You know, if you took it out, you'd have to have some plug to hold, you know, plug that hole back up, and uh, it's a, it'd be a pretty big hole. So. Plus, when you upgrade to the 40-gallon pot. Hmm, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing is that, you know, sometimes um, I'm, not, I'm only going to do, let's say, a 5-gallon batch, and, you know, the, the, that's a big pot to do 5 gallons in. Um, so what I will do is uh, sometimes I'll pull down the, what I'm now using as my mash tun, which is a kegel, um, and I'll pull that down and I'll use the heat stick in there, um, you know, so I can switch back and forth. It's kind of nice. So after, uh, after you've got it to, after the boil is over, time to chill? Yeah, I currently still use an immersion chiller. Uh, I just put that in the, uh, the, the brew pot there, um, chill, and then uh, I usually do uh, a chill, and then I do the kind of the, the ice uh, chill you know depending on you know around here in the summer especially you can't hardly get it cold enough um so i have a little kind of little pond pump that i put in a cooler and i'll do the the ice circulation um at the very end to drive the temperature really you know down to fermentation temperature before i pump it over into the fermenter as many hops as you put in a beer an immersion chiller may be uh the easiest thing not to get all clogged up (laughs) yeah that that's true um you know i I certainly could get the you know uh, one of those plate chillers, and I've thought about it. Um, but I you know my I do put an awful lot of hops in some of my beers, and uh, 
that you know, they would just clog one of those up. And uh, although there are some there's some new gadgets out there from some of my favorite vendors of brewing hardware that uh, <laughs> that I might be looking to acquire soon that might help me with that. <laughs> And so, the, so it's all chilled, and then you pump it into uh, the fermenters and put it in the uh, the fermentation fridge. and And do you set do you do you control the temperature of the fridge with the BCS as well? Yeah, that's right. So what I'll do is um, when I pump it over there, I'll actually try to get the refrigerator and the fermenters to the temperature that they're gonna be in. And if I've made a starter. I usually have the starter sitting in there too, so it's basically sitting at the temperature the beer will end up at. Um, and from time to time, you know, I'll pump it over and then I'll check the temperature on the fermenter and it'll be maybe still a couple degrees higher than I want it to be. So I just let it sit in there for another couple hours with a refrigerator running and it'll get it to where it needs to be. So, um, like I said, usually I just set it to, um, you know, whatever, like uh, 68 degrees, 64 degrees, whatever I'm trying to hit. Um, depending on what kind of fermenter it is, uh, like I said, when I'm using, uh, a keg, a converted keg, or a keg to do it. I, I'll use one with a, an actual thermal well in it. Uh, I also have a Blechman conical, and I just tape the uh, the temperature probe to the side of it when I use it because it doesn't have a thermal well. Um, and then the same thing with uh, with uh, glass carboys. I'll just tape the the, the thing the the temperature probe to the side of it um, to to try and monitor the the temperature of the fermenter. Um, but for the most part, you can just, you, what you do is you just set the fermenter, the cabinet, to be the temperature you want the beer to be at, right? Um, and, and it'll just keep trying to push it to that point. Um, now the beer is going to try and push you past that point because the beer is going to try to warm up a little bit as it, it's releasing that energy as it ferments. Um, but the refrigerator will keep driving it back, holding it to that temperature. Um, and then, you know, if I want to, uh, you could actually program into the BCS uh, ramping. Tim, yeah, so you can actually go in there and say, uh, from this temperature to this temperature, over this amount of time, ramp it. And it will basically, so like let's say and you're doing a saison or something and you're wanting to start it at, uh, you know, a moderate temperature, 68 degrees. And then by the end of the, you know, week, week and a half, you want it up 80, 85 degrees or something. You could actually have it do that where it's actually going and, oh, you know, four hours from now it'll be a little warmer. Four more hours it'll be a little warmer, you know. So uh, I usually don't do that. I usually just come out here in the morning and uh, change it, bump it up by another degree or two, and then do that again the next day and do that again the next day. I'm, I'm always wanting to be out here fidgeting with it anyway and uh, watching the beer and, and playing with it. So it's, uh, it's easy for me just to come and monkey with it and also... If I get to work and I decide, oh, I'd forgotten to change the temperature, the set point, I just log in and, and change it. And that'd be handy if you were doing a lager, if you wanted to uh, do your primary fermentation at a certain temperature and then wrap up to a diacetyl uh, rest and then ramp down to uh, long-term, you know, lagering temperatures. That'd be a really easy way to do it as well. Yep, and I have, I've done that in, I've, I've only done a couple lagers. Uh, I did one recently and uh, it's what I did in here. Um, I, I ran it up, diacetyl rest, and then I ran it down until it got cold. And then pretty much as soon as I got it cold, then I moved it into a cooler that's already cold. So then I could start to use the fermentation cabinet for back up to, you know, normal temperatures for fermentation in the 60s for ales and stuff. Yeah, for, you, for your favorite hoppy ales. Yes. <laughs> well, and then, then you've got... Uh, do you want to talk about the guts of the the magic beer fridge? I mean, you've got quite a lot of beer on tap. How do you manage all that CO two? Um, well, uh, I do. I have a I have this three door refrigerator here, and inside I actually have um, a CO two tank in there, and then I have a gas manifold. Um, so there's like a six way manifold inside here. So if you look down inside here, which uh, when we do the video, we'll be able to show this, but. Uh, so there's a, a, a manifold with six drops on it, so I can actually run CO2 to six different kegs, um, and then I run up to a, a another manifold or up to another uh, controller where I actually control the the the, the uh, pressure for the whole refrigerator. So the 
the the tank has a, a pressure gauge on it that monitors it and whatever I, if I split off and I want to carbonate I can use it high pressure and then I have like a standing pressure that's just serving pressure for the whole refrigerator and that's got a separate manifold for that mm. um, and I also have a CO2 filter which runs across the back I don't know how necessary that is but it just seems like a nice thing to have so the CO2 comes out of the tank through its normal regulator runs up to a quick disconnect that hooks into the filter runs through the filter to a pressure regulator that controls all the pressure for the fridge down to the six outlets and then from there out to the six different kegs although there's more than six kegs in here right now <laughs> and you can kind of switch back and forth uh, you know as serving uh, demands uh, necessitate right i have uh, i have a couple drops um for commercial kegs for like sankey d taps and sankey s taps um, and then I also have some of the drops for uh, homebrew kegs, the, the, the old soda pop kegs. So it doesn't matter. I can hook either one up pretty much at any time. Well, this is, uh, it's interesting. You know, I've, I've, I've learned a couple of things, a couple of details that I didn't, uh, that I didn't know before. So this has been very useful. Is there, is there anything else that uh, we shouldn't, should be uh, talking about that we haven't yet? Mm. Well, the only thing else is probably I, I do have some some toolboxes that I that I have that where my brewery is and and I really think they make a big difference um, in my organization and that is that um, there's these the trays and I can lay out all my brewing gear in them horizontally and flat um, and also at the top is where I set up all the the equipment to monitor the the the, the laptop and all that stuff. So it allows me to not just have all my brewing gadgets and stuff in a box or piled in a bag somewhere. and uh, They're all laid out flat, and I can, when I pull the drawer open, I can see them. So I have a drawer that has, like, ball valves in it. I have a drawer that has racking canes and auto siphons and thieves all along. They need a place to lay down and, and, and dry out. Um, so that's the other thing I really like is that, uh, you know, adds that level of organization to the brewery. That's very nice. Mine... My stuff's all stored in the basement, uh, and you know, running up and down the stairs gets a little old. So I'm <laughs> this is very nice to have it, uh, and it's a lot. It's a lot. It looks a lot better. It looks a lot more organized than my stuff, which is on just shelves downstairs. Um, but very cool. And uh, what? So what's on your what's on your dream list? I mean, what's next mm. on your list to improve the system? What are you missing? Mm. Well. I really would like to get a better way to manage the super hoppy beers. They, uh, you know, when you when you put a lot of hops in a beer, uh, you end up with a lot of waste. Um, it's very difficult to separate them, especially at a homebrew level. Um, I do. I have a pump. I, I I I do the whirlpool thing. It's just not the same as a professional whirlpool. Uh, it's. Mm-hmm. It, uh, and but I'd like to find a way that does it really well. Um, so there's some gadgets I'm looking at um, for that. Um, I also would like to do the uh, recirculation infusion uh, mash um, so that uh, I might be able to set it up where I could do temperature steps on my mash tun without just stirring with a heat stick, where I could do a pump and recirculation uh, past a heating element uh, controlled by the um, the uh, BCS and uh, be able to do that. So I'm kind of looking at some gadgets to do that. Um, mainly right now, though, what I'd like to do is get the rest of the garage kind of cleared up and then put in a sink. That's the, really the big thing I want to do is, and that's really, to me, that's going to be one of the big things that brings me close to being done with what I want is to have a, a stainless deep sink here in the garage with hot and cold running water so that in the middle of winter, I can do everything in here from washing, cleaning up, uh, and also have a filtered water standing by in the garage. So when I want to brew, I just get the filter, take it over, hang it in the you know in the brew pot, and and turn on the water and or in the hot liquor tank and and fill it up and uh, and be ready to go. So. And then the floor drain. And then, yeah. and then the waterproof walls that you can clean with just spraying, and then the uh, <laughs> yeah, 
I don't know about the floor drain. We'll see. <laughs> Probably just a squeegee. <laughs> just push it out the door. Yeah, that's right. You could just push it out on the driveway and let the rain take care of it. Well, this has been fun, Andy. I appreciate the time. No problem. Welcome anytime, James. Well, thanks again, as always, to Andy Sparks. You can find Andy's shop at thehomebrewery.com. And uh, in person, if you're ever in northwest Arkansas, you can drop by his uh, shop in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And uh, it's right behind the new Come and Go, which is a convenience store. And I look forward to, uh, <laughs> I look forward to exploring the magic beer fridge at uh, Andy's annual Christmas party. Always fun. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site along with our Brewer's Logbook. Get yours before the beginning of the year. Uh, They're going out the door right now. Uh, we got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on BasicBrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at BasicBrewingShop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com links. We appreciate the support there greatly. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are... Do-wops and hooligans. That came from the UK link. And easy-to-do card tricks for children. Very cool. I was way into magic as a kid. <laughs> Big surprise. I, <laughs> I, you guys are really. Uh, I said it last week that you guys are wearing out that link, and, uh, and you are. It's a, uh, it's impressive to see all the stuff that's going through there. Computers and expensive shoes and books and music and holy smokes it's just amazing thanks again everybody uh, remember i can't tell who bought what so no worries there just click on the amazon.com logos on our site the next time you feel like amazon shopping and we definitely appreciate your support don't forget you can also join the american homebrewers association or subscribe to brew your own magazine brew your, brew your magazine otherwise known as brew your own magazine through our associate links on basicbrewing.com as well well that's it thank goodness thanks uh, for listening. Until until next week, <laughs> I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dodson down in Austin, Texas. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.